Bald Villain back again. Forrest Gavage here uh, from uh, Bald Villain as well as Southbound Cinema. And uh, on eBay, um, Mr. Gab's For Life. Mr. Gab's For Life. And I uh, sell movies and wrestling, comic books, and now rock and roll merchandise on eBay. But today, I'm watching Tulane Blacktop from uh, the Criterion Collection, directed by a guy named Monty Hellman. And, gotta get my notes. If you know that name, Monty Hellman, but you've never even heard of Tulane Blacktop or China Nine, Liberty Seven, or any of the other films he's made, but you know that name, that means that you read the credits when you watched the movie Reservoir Dogs. Uh, Monty Hellman was, I believe, an associate producer on Reservoir Dogs, and uh, I think he was also a teacher at the workshop where Quentin Tarantino initially came up with the idea for Reservoir Dogs. If you watch the old DVD, it might be on the Blu-ray also, I don't know, but if you watch the old DVD, there are scenes shot on analog video with uh, Steve Buscemi as Mr. Pink, I believe, and uh, Quentin as Mr. White. And they are playing, uh, they are playing out some scenes that uh, change a little bit that eventually wind up in Reservoir Dogs. So uh, Monty Hellman is uh, the, the director of this film and one of the reasons that uh, Reservoir Dogs uh, even exists. And uh, on top of that, Reservoir Dogs borrows a little bit in terms of style from Tulane Blacktop because if you've uh, if you remember in Reservoir Dogs, there's uh, there's no music that uh, is used as score. All of the music is incidental. Even Little Green Bag, Stuck in the Middle with You, all of these songs are on the radio, and uh, that's a uh, that's a, a little tribute to to Tulane Blacktop. All of the songs are on the air. They're just part. Of, they're just part of the atmosphere. Uh, that said, this is not the same kind of movie. This is a very sparse uh, road movie, and what is often referred to as an existential movie. Uh, I'm not a philosophy major by any stretch. I got a few books on existentialism. I got a few uh, a few plays by Sartre and uh, some novels by Camus, and I'm getting through them, and I like them a lot. But uh, I'm by no means an expert. I can tell you this though: as far as existentialism goes, it's more of a mood uh, than it is a philosophy. It's almost an acknowledgement that it's it's that horrible, horrible, uh, horrible thing that I, I can't stand it when people say it, but it is what it is where you kind of just have to accept things as they are. Um, okay, yeah, all right, I'll buy that sometimes, all right? It's in the, in, as far as this movie goes, hey, great. Um, and some of these characters do wind up uh, accepting things as they are, except for one, and his name is The Driver, and he's played by the folk singer, James Taylor. He is The Driver. He drives a 55 Chevy that he and uh, the mechanic, played by the Beach Boys' Dennis Wilson. Yes, that Dennis Wilson. The Charles Manson uh, Dennis Wilson, okay? Um, the late Dennis Wilson. Um, they, they go cross country uh, hustling other uh, hot rodders for for money as they move on and here comes this uh, here comes this GTO the character's name is GTO played by Warren Oates who is uh, probably the best performance in the film he's great um, Warren uh, owns this GTO and you could tell this guy thinks very highly of himself he likes uh, he likes living the fancy life he likes living the high life he's an older gentleman I, I think. I think he is probably meant to be in his mid-40s. Uh, he looks older than that, but everybody smoked back then, right? So Warren, uh, GTO rather, um, gets interested just like everybody. Everybody who sees this 55 Chevy built from the ground up, built out of, you can tell, this, this, uh, this bucket of bolts is just built out of nothing, right? Yeah, that, that thing is built out of lug nuts and hopes and dreams and boogers and sweat, man. It's built out of nothing, right? And um, the GTO looks like it's fresh off the lot, okay? So you could tell where this movie's heart really lies. You could tell what the philosophy is right away. 
it's uh, this quest as far as uh, who's the real alpha dog uh, out there on the open road, okay? And uh, yeah, it's, it's the guy who really lives it. It's the guy who really lives it, right? So, anyway. Um, Warren Oates plays GTO, and like everybody else in this movie, he sees that 55 and gets really, really curious and really, really interested. Unfortunately, he's so insecure that he keeps seeing the 55. Um, just, yeah, not necessarily, uh, well, it is. It's, it's honestly, it's by coincidence because they're both headed in the same direction. Um, uh, maybe, could be. Um, and he starts to get paranoid. He thinks that they're following them. And so, we, it's already established early on in the film that, uh, like Paul Newman in The Hustler, um, the driver and the mechanic, they know how to find a mark, and they know how to exploit that mark. And they exploit uh, anybody they can. Anybody who looks just a little bit insecure, and they're all that Warren Oates type. They're all um, older gentlemen. Uh, one guy, they uh, there's my favorite line in uh, my favorite line in the movie. Uh, I forget the whole exchange, but it ends with uh, it, it's it's this, it's this bald guy with with long hair. So he's trying real hard, man. It looks like looks like Ben Franklin. Uh, this bald guy with long hair, who's got a, a really sweet looking ride, real nice looking, takes real good care of it, and James Taylor trash talks the car. And uh, and this guy, there's a fly in here. Apologies, but it's gonna help me with this review. And uh, he and James Taylor have this back and forth, and uh, ta uh, it ends with Jay uh, with the guy saying, uh, "I forget, I forget how, I forget what the setup line is, but the best line in the movie." James Taylor says, uh, "Make it three yards, motherfucker, and we'll have us an automobile race." And they have them an automobile race, and of course, uh, James Taylor wins, and uh, we, you know, come to find out that that's essentially what these what these guys do. So Warren Oates is definitely their kind of mark. And he and uh, a, a GTO and the driver and the mechanic and a character named The Girl. Notice the names. Again, uh, nobody has real uh, nobody has real names in this movie. She's played by, give me a second, an actress named Lori Bird, who I don't I don't know from anything else. But they all uh, they're all in this cross-country race, and whoever wins the race, it's very uh, it's, you know, it's one of those movies, uh, it's, it's like a Smokey and the Bandit or Cannonball Run, except it's not a comedy. It's very funny. But uh, there's this, uh, there's the, they're on this cross-country trip, and whoever wins the race uh, gets pink slips for the car. And that's essentially the plot to Two Lane Blacktop. It is not, um, it's not a super dense plot at all. It's very, very, very uh, simple and straightforward and it's the kind of movie that you put on on a Saturday night when you want to watch something uh, specifically for purposes of mood and that's exactly what this movie does it sets a mood it's got a real uh, it's got a real lonely vibe even though you have these characters who do come together there's almost a brotherhood the secret brotherhood going on between the driver and the driver and the mechanic of course but also uh, GTO, no outsiders allowed, and the girl becomes one of them after uh, after a while. For a while, you're like, boy, they're not really uh, treating the girl too well. Uh, until after a while, uh, she uh, she becomes uh, kind of a part of the kind of a part of the gang to the point where she doesn't know which car to hang out in. She keeps uh, hanging out in one car, the the '55, the Chevy. Hanging out in the other in the GTO, she keeps bopping back and forth. It's uh, she's great. Uh, Lori Bird's great to watch. She kind of has the sissy spacek part in this. If you've seen Badlands, she's kind of the sissy spacek role in this movie. Let me look at my notes here real quick. Okay, so not so much a theme uh, perhaps, although themes of uh, of brotherhood and of uh, the outsiders not really being invited in do pop up here and there. Uh, auto racers are always uh, always hustling each other, okay? But they're also protective of each other. When, uh, for instance, um, at one point, Warren shows up and uh, he gives uh, or GTO 
shows up and gives the driver and the mechanic some grief. He's like, are we still racing or what? I got, uh, you know, I, I, I got some stuff to do. And uh, in comes another one of these outsiders who just got curious, right? Hey, man, what you got What you got under that hood and all that kind of stuff, asking, um, asking the driver and the mechanic. And uh, Warren steps in on their behalf and says, I'm these boys' manager, right? He doesn't want anybody else. So, 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 so now we don't, we don't want to talk about any of this. Uh, thank you, son. They don't want anybody else. The GTO doesn't want anybody else involved in this, right? I don't necessarily think that that's entirely out of uh, self-interest. I think that he does this because there's this unspoken bond. Either that, or he is exploiting that possible bond. But uh, one, way, one way or another, um, these, uh, these four uh, find their way cross-country, and uh, in the end, nobody really gets what they were looking for. No, no, no spoilers here, I won't completely spoil the movie. Especially the big, big moment at the end. If you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. The way the film ends. I don't want to. I don't want to spoil it too much. But the first time I saw it, um, I was not happy with the ending at all. And uh, I watched it a few minutes ago, and I've come to appreciate it now. If you know what I'm, if you know what I'm talking about, okay. Uh, Ah, I don't. I really don't want to spoil it. Um, I'm gonna spoil it. Ready? S spoilers. Here's how the movie ends. I'm gonna tell you. Who cares, right? If if you haven't seen the movie, what? Watch the movie. Um, James t uh, or uh, the driver and the mechanic, or rather, I'm sorry, the girl takes off with some guy on a motorcycle. She ditches all of them. Okay, and there's this weird duality throughout the film also where uh, the driver and the mechanic and the girl are having this conversation and then GTO and the girl will have a similar conversation uh, later on, right? At one point there's a, there's a hitchhiker who, who uh, played by Harry Dean Stanton, the great Harry Dean Stanton, okay? GTO picks up a hitchhiker and uh, at one point, and the hitchhiker puts his hand on GTO's uh, leg, and GTO, I'm not into that, get out of here, right? And that mirrors a scene where um, the girl is giving the driver a massage, and she goes, you seem tense, and he says, I'm fine with that, or I like it that way, right? Um, intense focus, intense focus from... Uh, from James Taylor in all in throughout this whole movie, he looks like Peter Steele from Typo Negative. He's just like constantly, you know. Anyway, the girl ditches uh, both parties, and uh, GTO, who had made some plans to uh, to take her to New York, he just takes off and he leaves. And uh, you could tell he's just like oh, son of a bitch, man, <laughs> you know, and. Uh, the driver and the mechanic, they move on to their next race. And at one point, um, at a couple points throughout the movie, every time everybody, every time GTO picks up a hitchhiker, he picks up a lot of hitchhikers. He loves talking about his car. and He's, he's got a bullshit story for everybody. He's like the Joker with the scars in The Dark Knight. He's got a different story for everybody, right? And GTO, at the end of this movie, he gets to tell this story that he has made up about having won this car, having won the pink slip for this car, and dusting that 55 Chevy. And uh, of course it didn't happen that way, he's making this story up, but he gets the satisfaction of telling the story. So he gets uh, a fake satisfaction, yet that's what he, it's still satisfaction to him. Meanwhile. The driver gets behind the wheel, gets into uh, gets into uh, the last automobile race we see in in the film, and everything goes silent. There's no there's no sound. It plays with it plays with the language of cinema near the end. It's really cool. 
Uh, like it, like in 2001 when there's no sound. Same same principle here, right? And uh, he starts driving. He takes a look right before the race starts, and uh, we literally see the broadside of a barn. As in, you couldn't hit the broadside of a barn. That's kind of a kind of an interesting little visual metaphor, right? And he uh, starts the car, and he starts racing, and the film goes slow-mo, and then the film breaks. You know, like in, uh, you know, like, like, like in third grade when you were watching a 16 millimeter film in class, if you're old enough to remember that. I'm 43, so I remember, okay? We were at the tail end of that. We had the film strips, too, that went, you know. But uh, the first time I saw the movie, I was not happy. I thought, what a cop out! What a cop out! What a what a what a what a, what a, what a, um, a cheesy ending! What a cheesy way to end this film! And then the more I think about it, the more I think, okay, this is the end of that illusion. Film is an illusion. What I'm doing right now is an illusion. Yeah, I'm doing this in one take as best I can, um, but you know. I've got some lights on. This isn't the natural lighting in here, right? I've got notes on a little sticky pad. I'm not. I'm not completely winging it. But um, cinema is an illusion, and these characters do live a life of illusion and delusion. Um, the driver, as intense as he is, as focused as he is, he's not always going to win. He's not always going to win it, and. Uh, once Warren takes off, we never do find out about the pink slips for the car. We can assume that they didn't finish the race. That they all just, you know, decided, okay, well, neither of us got the girl, so who the fuck cares, man? We're just gonna all go on our happy-ass way. So that duality, that yin and yang between the two parties is very much apparent. And so, yeah, the film breaks and our illusion is, uh, is killed, too. So, um, you know, I guess uh, GTO gets to keep his uh, illusions. He'll just keep lying to people. Oh, man. Let's see, this movie came out in 71. So imagine, uh, imagine GTO driving around in 81 uh, in his early 50s or mid 50s telling the same bullshit stories because he likes to hear himself talk. It's really sad, right? So, okay. Um, Talked about that. Talked about that. Talked about that. Okay, so here's what the um, here's what the DVD comes with. I've I've had this for a few years. I don't have the Blu-ray, but uh, the uh, the DVD is really nice. Comes with a copy of the original script. Okay, and if you look at that, hold on, let me show you that. The cover. These two, James Taylor, of all people, James Taylor, right, the folk singer. And Dennis Wilson, a beach boy, man. Those two fellas. Oh, there's the girl. I'm sorry. Jeez, I didn't even see her then. Um, what a great photo. I'd love a, I'd love a poster of that. I'm not a car guy. I'm not a gearhead by any by any stretch. I drive a Kia because it was cheap, you know? Uh, finally paid it off, but it wasn't with no damn YouTube money, I can tell you that. Um, and I uh I love this movie, and I love movies about cars and I love movies about gearheads as long as as long as I know what I'm getting myself into and as long as they're not um, I guess too goofy although you know what man I watched the first Fast and Furious for the first time a couple of weeks ago a couple months back and I really enjoyed it. I had a great time watching The Fast and the Furious. I guess it took me a few years to finally go, okay, well, let's, let's take a step back. The series has been around long enough. Um, I've, had, uh, I've had people tell me, hey, man, you got to watch those movies, man. I can't believe you haven't seen those. So, yeah, I watched the first uh, Fast and Furious and had a really good time. Um, I, of course, like movies like Death Proof and... Um, uh, Vanishing Point, which is referenced heavily in Death Proof. I love the Hemi Cuda in the Phantasm movies. I like the Joe Bob Briggs rant about the Hemi Cuda that blows up in Phantasm 2. So, 
I'm not a gearhead. I never learned how to work on a car or how to uh, how to fix a car really or how to build a car. But um, I admire that uh, I admire that work ethic and I admire that knowledge base. So I love movies about that culture, and this movie really does explore that culture in a mythical American way. The there's a little bit of uh, there's a little bit of Easy Rider in. It. In fact, there's a there's a lot of Easy Rider in this movie. This is like a, this is like a a, a bigger budget uh, Easy Rider. This was from Universal. It's shot in two three five uh, Panavision widescreen. I think it's Panavision, but it's two three five. It's a uh, beautifully directed it's beautifully shot it has uh, fantastic actors um, it's it's an absolutely uh, absolutely stellar film and it's uh, and it's definitely worth your time so if um, if you like movies about um, if you like movies about car culture Tulane blacktop is one of the originals it's it's one of the prototypes okay? Um, road movies and so on, indie indie road movies, right? It's not a, it, it's 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 a drama. I guess you could put it in the drama section at your video store or on Netflix or whatever. But it's um, it's a little, you know, it's it's a little road movie from a time, the early 70s, 71, when Hollywood was taking some risks. They stopped taking risks after. Uh, after movies like Tulane Black, from what I understand, Tulane Blacktop didn't do as well as they wanted to. Um, Easy Riders Raging Bulls covers that. I'm, po I'm pointing to the book; it's over there. Um, Easy Riders Raging Bulls covers that. It was really Dennis Hopper's the last movie that um, killed it for a lot of filmmakers. The studios decided, "Nah, we're gonna um, we're gonna put the kibosh on uh, all you hippies doing whatever the hell you want to with your movies, right?" So. Um, this, uh, this film does come from a time when uh, studio filmmakers had a lot more freedom to, uh, to, make, to, to make movies that were different and to tell interesting stories. And yeah, they're catering to that youth market. Who was catering to the youth market two years before? Um, Easy Rider. Who was catering to the youth market on a much lower scale uh, before that? I don't even want to call it a lower scale because he put out tons of movies. Roger Corman. Roger Corman was making just movie after movie after movie that was catering to the youth market. All, all of these, uh, those AIP uh, biker movies and uh, stuff like The Trip with uh, with Peter Fonda. That's where Peter Fonda, Jack Nicholson, and uh, Dennis Hopper all got their start was through Roger Corman. Although I guess Hopper had done a few things. He'd done television. He'd been in uh, uh, Rebel Without a Cause and films like that. But uh, for the most part, these guys uh, these guys really did uh, cut their teeth on those uh, those AIP films, and the the youth market noticed, and that's the, that that drive-in culture, right? It's uh, it's how technology changes our habits. The medium is the message, like McLuhan used to say, right? So think about that. All these kids, you know, teenagers in the fifties. Uh, getting behind the wheel for the first time, driving the family automobile to the drive-in. You got to put something on the screen. So you put something on the on the screen that is reflective of the audience, and that's what those AIP movies did. So those same kids, ten years later, right? Or how about the younger brothers and sisters of those kids? Ten years later, all right? They're not. Uh, they're, they're, they're not greasers or beatniks, they're hippies, right? So they're gonna go watch something like Easy Rider. And then, uh, then the, you know, the decade turns and uh, here we are with Tulane Blacktop. And Tulane Blacktop is a, uh, like, a like a more respectable version. Uh, I, I, Easy Rider's raw. Easy Rider's uh, cut together with, uh, you know, with, with, with like, like it, I, I, I liken Texas Chainsaw Massacre to Easy Rider, right? It's it's the it's the Easy Rider of horror films. Tulane Blacktop is uh, that that step forward. It's almost like uh, it, it may, maybe Halloween is the the Tulane Blacktop of horror films, right? It's it if uh, spit it out, man. <laughs> Texas Chainsaw Massacre is to uh, Easy Rider what Halloween is to, to Tulane Blacktop, if that makes any sense to my genre film fans out there. Anyway, I've gone on way too long. 
watch this movie if you like that sort of thing. And uh, if you've seen it, uh, let me know what you think in the comments below. I'm dying to hear from you, all right? I'll be around. Thanks.